welcome to another episode of uh, this series that we've been going through, myself and our dear brother, Dr. David Wood, in relationship to many of the arguments raised by our Muslim friend. I'm your host, Al Fadi, and you can always watch this particular series at sirainternational.com and also at our YouTube channel. And same also applies to our brother, uh, David Wood, where you can watch it also at his YouTube channel, Act 17 Apologetics. Uh, today we are going to talk about an interesting, of course, argument that uh, you hear about over and over again. It has to do with the idea that Muhammad is found in the Bible. And let me tell you this, as a former Muslim, I honestly find this argument laughable for a one reason. The reason is, I've always believed the Bible is corrupt. So how can I go to the Bible to try to find something that supports my own belief when I've already discounted the source that I want to use to prove my own belief? With that in mind, I want to turn it over to Dr. David Wood. Well, you, you're, you're, you're absolutely correct there in, in the absurdity of so many Muslims claiming that the Bible's been corrupted and then trying to show us from the Bible that Muhammad was a true prophet. I mean, even if you did find something in the Bible saying that Muhammad was a prophet, if Muslims are also saying that the Bible's been corrupted, how would we know that that's not one of the corrupted parts? Exactly. Um, but this is, Muslims do use this argument, and there's a reason Muslims use this argument. The reason is that it comes from the Quran. Uh, it's a claim from the Quran that the Bible contains prophecies about the coming of Muhammad. And this has to be in both the Old and New Testament. So let's turn to the Quran to see what Allah says about the Torah and the Gospel. Chapter 7, verse 157 of the Quran says that those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the Torah and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. So notice a couple of things that this means. One, it means that Jews and Christians still had the Torah and the gospel during the time of Muhammad. So that means that the Torah and the gospel had been transmitted uh, down to the seventh century at least. And that's interesting because we have copies of the Torah and the gospel from before that time. So Absolutely. we know what the Torah and the gospel of the seventh century said. Uh, but it's also interesting in that it gives us a way to test Muhammad's revelations. Right? Right. If I say, hey, I'm, I'm mentioned in the Bible or I'm mentioned here, I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity to investigate my claims. That's and correct. so the Quran here gives us an opportunity to test whether Muhammad was a true prophet. Now, Muslims for 14 centuries have been looking through the Bible to try and find where it talks about Muhammad. Um, there are many of these places. We don't have time to go through all of them, but we'll go through the best. We'll go through the best according to them. In other words, if you uh, look up what this verse is talking about in Yusuf Ali's uh, edition of the Quran or many other uh, editions of the Quran, uh, when it says that Muhammad is found in the Torah and the Gospel, uh, they give two main passages, one from the Torah, one from the Gospel, as their main proof that Muhammad is mentioned in our scriptures. Right. And so the main passages they give are one from Deuteronomy 18 and one from John chapter 14. So the Torah and the Gospel. So we'll look right. at the best. We won't look through all of them. We can do that later. But right now we want to look at the best ones. So the... Top prophecy from the Torah is Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Some Muslims will also put Deuteronomy 18, 18, which basically say the th same thing, that uh, God's going to send a prophet like Moses. So Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses speaking, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, you shall listen to him. Right. Now, there are so many problems with claiming that this is about Muhammad, but Muslims still argue it, and they'll, they'll use arguments along the lines of, Moses was a political leader and a military leader right. and a prophet, so all simultaneously. Muhammad and Moses were like each other in this sense because that's what Muhammad was too. Uh, they both delivered a law to their people. So look at the similarities. This is what this is saying. Now, just by reading the verse, you can already see some of the problems. A prophet like me from among you, who's he talking to? He's talking, talking to, to the Jews. He's talking to Jews. 
from your countrymen, which this, this translates it as countrymen, it's actually brethren, and Muslims will argue that brethren here refers to their brethren, the Ishmaelites. Now, the problem is any time, any time the Torah is talking about someone, someone else, because they are their brethren in a sense, they're, they're, they're right. relatives, it will say your brethren who are, and it will specify the other group. Correct. When it just says brethren, as it does even in the same chapter, it's talking about your fellow Jews. The 12 tribes primarily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, e even, even if you just read what this is saying, no, no Jew during this time would have thought, oh, this is talking about a, a prophet coming from among the Arabs uh, 2,000 years from now. It would have never entered anyone's mind. And the setting is important. This is in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. They're prepared to enter into the prophet, uh, into the promised land. Where is the Ishmaelites here? There mm -hmm. is no Ishmaelites whatsoever. Yeah. And so even if we just read the verse, there's something strange about appealing to this. But Muslims will say Muhammad was like Moses in various ways. And, and you, you can see why they would argue that, that Muhammad and Moses were similar in certain ways. The problem, of course, is that when the Bible talks about a prophet like Moses, we know what that phrase, like Moses, meant mm -hmm. in this context. And we know it from the book of Deuteronomy itself. The same book tells us what this is referring to when it's talking about someone coming like Moses. Correct. So we'll turn to the next verse, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 10 through 12. This is the very end and says that this prophet hasn't arisen, right? The prophet, like Moses, hasn't come yet. It says, since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. Notice, like Moses, so they're talking about the prophet like Moses. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Israel against Pharaoh, all his servants, and all his land, and for all the mighty and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of Israel. So, Someone the Lord knew face to face and for all the signs and wonders. So many signs and wonders that uh, they would terrify the unbelievers, right? That's right. So is that Muhammad, right? Did Muhammad perform miracles? Well, we, we just covered that. We've that, covered that, that, right? Muhammad didn't have a single one. So Muhammad performed zero miracles. Um, so he certainly isn't like Moses in that sense. What about knowing the Lord face to face. Did well, Muhammad know the Lord face to face? Absolutely not. Aisha said in some traditions that he never spoke to his Lord face to face. We know that it's Gabriel that was mm -hmm. communicating with him. So even according to Muslim sources, Allah doesn't come to Muhammad. That's right. Allah sends a messenger to Muhammad. Correct. So is Muhammad, the prophet like Moses, when we look at what that phrase like Moses means in the context of Deuteronomy. Can't be. Wrong guy, exactly. right? So whoever exactly. this is applying to, and the apostles of Jesus believed it was applying to him, right? He's That's the one right. who has such a close relationship with the Father that he can communicate in a special way with the Father. But also Jesus is performing signs and wonders in the presence of Israel. So just looking at what that means in the context of the book of Deuteronomy makes absolutely no sense. But there's another problem, is that the very same passage, Deuteronomy 18, the very same passage rules out Muhammad as a prophet. According to Deuteronomy 18, Muhammad can't be a prophet at all. And here I'm referring to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. So in, in Deuteronomy 18, 15, we find that, that, that God's going to send a prophet like Moses, right. repeats it in Deuteronomy 18, 18. Correct. And then just two verses later in the same passage, right. we find this. God says, the same God who says he's sending a prophet like Moses says, but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So the same God who says he's sending a prophet like Moses says, I'm giving you two criteria here that will allow you to spot a false prophet. Correct. And the two criteria we have here are, if he speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak. So if he gives a revelation and says, this revelation is from God and it's not actually from God, that's a false prophet. 
right. or which he speaks in the name of other gods. So you promote polytheism, then you're a false prophet. So if you speak in the name of other gods, or you deliver a message and say it's from God, then it doesn't actually come from God, you're a false prophet. Why is this important? Because Muhammad did both. And I'm not just referring to, to the Quran or something like that. I mean, even according to Muslim sources, Muhammad promoted polytheism and he delivered a revelation that didn't come from God. And here I'm referring to what are called the satanic verses. Correct. According to Muslim sources, and I have 37 Muslim sources on the satanic verses. And you can see how the story changed over time. The Absolutely. earliest versions of the story, um, Muhammad is receiving He's receiving verses of the Quran and then Satan steps in, tricks him into affirming prayers to Alat Alusa and Manat. Right. So these are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. Exalted cranes meaning they're like birds who can carry your prayers to Allah. And so what, what it's saying is they're basically intercessors. Yes, you still believe in Allah, but they're intercessors between you and Allah. The uh, the, the goddesses, Allah, Alusa, and Manat. So you can now pray to them because they will take your prayers to Allah. Right. And so Muhammad delivers this to his followers. He bows down in honor of the revelation and his followers bow down with him. But here's what's interesting. The pagans bow down as well. The polytheists of Mecca bow down in honor of the revelation as well because they were overjoyed that Muhammad was now affirming their goddesses. So this is according to the earliest versions of the story. Muhammad receives this revelation, his followers bow down, and the, 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 the polytheists bow down as well. But sometime later, Gabriel comes to him and says, hey, those verses that you revealed to your followers, saying that they can now pray to Allah, Alusa, and Manat, Satan tricked you into doing that. Satan gave you those verses. So a couple of problems here already. One, Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. Correct. In other words, Satan could trick and deceive him. He's supposedly uh, God's greatest prophet, according to Muslims, but he couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. That's according to Muslim sources, not according to me, although I agree. Um, so Muhammad receives this revelation, and then, of course, he repents, and those verses are wiped out of the Quran. Um, and... You still have the reference to Allah, Alusa, and Manat, but the meaning changes um, by removing the, the part about them being the exalted cranes. And so, but what do you have here? You have Muhammad delivering a revelation that doesn't come from God and saying it's a revelation from God. And you have Muhammad promoting polytheism and saying that you can now pray to these goddesses. And what's interesting here is when we read this in the context of Deuteronomy saying that these are the criteria of a false prophet and then we turn to the history of Atabari which gives us Muhammad's reaction once Gabriel rebukes him for promoting this message correct Muhammad says this is the history of Atabari volume 6 page 111 you can look up the history of Atabari it's available in PDF online right. go to chapter volume 6 page 111 where Muhammad says after the story of the satanic verses, he says, I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. This is Muhammad saying he delivered a revelation that didn't come from God. What was that revelation about? It was about praying to other goddesses. According to Deuteronomy, Muhammad is a false prophet. And Muslims claim that they reverence and have respect for Moses. Moses would have told people to pick up stones and stone Muhammad to death as a false prophet Absolutely. for delivering these verses. So Muhammad should be overjoyed that he was among polytheists uh, instead of among Mos instead of around Moses and his followers That's because correct. they would not have tolerated this sort of thing. Oops, I couldn't. I'm sorry. I'm a prophet, but I can't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. That's why I affirmed polytheism. Told you all it's okay to. Uh, to pray to goddesses. But, uh, you know, I changed my mind now uh, that Gabriel came and told me, of course, I can't tell the difference between a revelation that's coming through Gabriel and one coming from Satan. But, you know, Gabriel told me it's incoherent, right? They, they wouldn't have tolerated this. So. Absolutely. Now notice, Islam's best passage, the favorite passage of Muslims from the Old Testament, the prophet like Moses, if you just read the rest of the passage and know anything about Islamic history, the passage doesn't affirm Muhammad as a prophet. The, the passage says that Muhammad was a false prophet who would have been executed 
and during that, the time of, of, of Moses. And that's basically selective apologetics. And do we ever find anything else when we're dealing with this argument in, uh, yep. from Muslims? So notice, that's the best one. The best passage, after 14 centuries of examining the Bible, the best Old Testament passage Muslims can come up with to show that Muhammad is a prophet was a passage that specifically says Muhammad is a false prophet who would have been executed. Very and also, interesting. the other argument that I find um, baffling to me, in the scripture, in the Bible, for instance, whenever God wants to point to something that was mentioned about a particular uh, event or a person, usually that is quoted or referred to one way or another. Here, we don't find even a hint to Deuteronomy 18.15 or Deuteronomy 18.18 18 in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mentioned that he is in their books. So mm -hmm. what? Which books? Yeah. Are we talking the Talmud? We're talking the Midrash, the Mishnah. Because Muhammad the Bible. didn't know the difference between them, right? Exactly. Yeah, he 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 quotes from the from the Talmud and all, all exactly. kinds of all kinds exactly. of sources and doesn't know the difference between them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's their best from the Old Testament. Old Testament. Now, what about their best verse from the New Testament? Here, of course, is the claim that Muhammad is the comforter of John 14. Now, by, by the way, uh, playing around with passages that are about the the Holy Spirit. Would that be a good idea according to Christianity? Of course not. Oh yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty bad, ladies and gentlemen. That would be uh, about as blasphemous as you can get. Um, but uh, most Muslims don't know what they're doing here, so let's uh, let's be patient with them and read the passage. So this is John chapter fourteen, verses sixteen to seventeen. Jesus is about to be taken away. So his, his followers are upset because he's told them he's about to go. He's been announcing to them that he's going to die. First, they don't know what he's talking about. Then it finally starts setting in uh, what, he's, what he's actually telling them. And he's telling them, don't be upset. Uh, it's not like I'm just gone forever. Uh, I'm going to send you the comforter. And so John chapter 14 here, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper or comforter, uh, the Greek word is paraclete, uh, I will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is, now notice he identifies the helper as, that is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. This is their best passage to apply to Muhammad. Now, if we even here again, if we just read the passage, all sorts of things jump out, which should tell us instantly this has nothing to do with Muhammad. So one, Jesus says, I will ask the Father. Is, is God our Father according to Islam? God, the Quran says Allah is a father to no one. So what, what, what is Jesus here doing referring to God as, as Father? And he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. Jesus is talking to his apostles here. Was Muhammad with Jesus' followers forever? In what sense was Muhammad with Jesus' followers forever? Because, I mean, that's what Muslims will try to say. They'll try and say, oh, well, you know, because, the, you know, Jesus delivered the truth about Muhammad, and so the, the truth of Muhammad. It doesn't say, you know, facts about him, or uh, it says he will be with you. He will be with you, right? And so... Muhammad, if this is Muhammad, then Muhammad will be with you forever, with Jesus' apostles, who died centuries before Muhammad came along. Then we have, that is the spirit of truth. So here they'll say, oh, Muhammad was the spirit of truth. Now, this is just silly to so start talking about Muhammad as the spirit. Whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him. Last time I checked, the world did see Muhammad. Or know him, but you know him, the apostles know him. Because he abides with you, Muhammad abides with Jesus' followers, and right. will be in you. Wait a minute. Muhammad abides with Jesus' first century followers, his apostles. 1,400 is, years before his coming. And is going to be in the apostles? What, what is this? This makes absolutely no sense to think that this is referring to Muhammad. But it gets even better. Because notice here in uh, verse 16, says, he, the Father, will give you another helper. Right. But in this same passage, as Jesus continues, we have John chapter 16, verse 7. Jesus says, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
I right. will send him to you. Now, Al Fadi, uh, according to Islam, who sent Muhammad? Allah sent Muhammad. Allah sent Muhammad. That's right. So Muhammad is sent by Allah. Correct. Allah is the one who sent Muhammad. Uh, according to Jesus here, Jesus says, if I go, I will send him to you. So the helper, the comforter, is sent by who? By Jesus. So Jesus sends the comforter. That's correct. The comforter is sent by Jesus. So let me get this straight. Muhammad is sent by Allah. That's right. The comforter is sent by Jesus. That's correct. Now, if the comforter is sent by Jesus and Muhammad is sent by Allah, then if the comforter is Muhammad, who would that make Jesus? The God of Muhammad. So Jesus, according to Islam's most trusted prophecy about Muhammad in the gospel, Jesus is the God of Muhammad who sent him. Absolutely, and it backfires yet again. And so any Muslim, any Muslim who uses this argument, we can say, you just identified Jesus as your God. Thank you for supporting the Christian message exactly. about the deity of Christ. Exactly. Now you've committed shirk. Now you have to abandon Muhammad as a false prophet and reject his Quran and his revelation. That's correct. And so it, what, what's, what's really interesting here, if, if Muslims would just not pick and choose and be so selective, and oh, here's a part of a verse I can use without actually reading the passage. Notice, Jesus says in, in uh, chapter 14 that the Father will send him. And in, in chapter 17, Jesus says that, that he will send him. The Father and Son together send the Comforter. That's right. Who is the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit. This passage is thoroughly Trinitarian. No you, doubt. You can't no understand, doubt. you can't make sense of this passage apart from a doctrine like the doctrine of the Trinity. Yes. And this is the place where Muslims go to try and pull something out that supports Islam, not realizing that if, if we even took their argument seriously, if we even said for a second, Muhammad is the comforter, well then, if Muhammad's the comforter, then he's sent by Jesus and the Father, and therefore uh, that would make Muhammad the, the, the Holy Spirit. We'd have to reject Islam because we still have, we still have the Trinity, right? That's right. And that would, be, right. That, that would be false according to the Quran. So if we accept the Muslim argument, we have to reject Islam and reject Muhammad as a prophet. Um, but I mean, apart from that, I mean, look at the book they're going to, right? The book starts off by affirming the deity of Christ in chapter one. It ends with Thomas's confession uh, that Jesus is his Lord and his God. Right. Uh, Jesus dies on the cross for sins. Uh, in this book. Uh, over and over again, we have affirmations of Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity in this book, which thoroughly contradict the Islamic message about Jesus. Muslims go right into the middle of this book, rip something completely out of context, totally distort the meaning, and that's supposedly the proof of Islam. That's well, guess what? If that's the proof of Islam, then Muslims have a, have a, have a serious problem here, right? Because that's correct. Allah based the truth of his religion on this. Allah says, go to that book, you're going you're gonna to find references to Muhammad. Well, we've looked at the best two, and not only the best two not show that Muhammad is a prophet, if we look at their best two, we find Muhammad can't be a prophet. Absolutely. Old Testament or New Testament. According to the Bible, Muhammad was a false prophet. And if you know nothing else about Islam, if all you know about Islam is that Allah says, Go to the Bible to learn the truth about his prophet. And when we go to the Bible, it's one constant affirmation that Muhammad's a false prophet. You already know. You already know that Islam cannot be the truth. And so any Muslim who wants to know the truth about God, about Jesus, you have to go somewhere else, somewhere other than Muhammad and the Quran. Absolutely. And also, uh, I kind of laugh when Muslims, whenever you pick a verse from the Quran, they tell you you have to put it in context. Mm -hmm. So let's put the uh, John 14, 16 in context. In John 14, 6, the Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Mm -hmm. There you have the context. And by the way, aren't, aren't, aren't those titles of Allah? Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's obvious that Muslims acknowledge that Jesus is the way to heaven and acknowledge that God is called the Father at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you cannot pick and choose. 
You cannot just selectively say, I like this, but I don't like that. The Bible is corrupt except for these passages, and the list can go on and on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you've enjoyed uh, this particular episode. Uh, obviously, this is a deep topic. There are so many other passages Muslims typically use from the Bible. Uh, for now, you can go ahead and Google that. I advise you to go, for instance, to a number of websites that are very reputable, like answering-islam.org. Uh, our brother's, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, website, uh, which is answeringmuslims.com. And there are many other reputable websites that deal with that. But Lord willing, in the future, we will take uh, care of all of those one by one. But uh, these two passages that we mentioned to you in Deuteron Deuteronomy 18 and in John 14, uh, the two top passages used by our Muslim friends. So hopefully uh, you find this explanation very helpful to you. And don't be surprised if a Muslim that you're dealing with brings up this idea that Muhammad is in the Bible when just earlier told you that the Bible is corrupt. Don't blame him. That's what they're told. And uh, with that says, um, I look forward, of course, to doing more episodes with you, brother. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give our audience um, uh, another, uh, uh, basically, a, a topic that mm -hmm. uh, we might address in the near future? Well, the uh, the next topic we'll be covering it sort of uh, sort of ends the main arguments, right? There are other Muslim arguments, but this sort of closes out the ones you hear constantly. And that, of course, is the the argument from scientific accuracy, the claim that uh, the Quran is filled with miraculous scientific insights and that Muhammad uh, made miraculous scientific claims which weren't verified until centuries uh, after his death and therefore he must be a prophet. So that's Amen. what we'll be checking Amen. out next. Thank you so much and thank you to all of you. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.